And this is what happens with growth hormone release when you give both of them. Okay, so there's a big, big synergistic effect in combining both of these. So going back to this concept of how do we get growth hormone release? Well, we get growth hormone release when we have in positive input from the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor or the ghrelin receptor, which is the growth hormone stimulating receptor, when somatostatin is not inhibiting the release. So when somatostatin is present, growth hormone is not released. When it is not there, if there is a stimulus from the GHSR or the GRH, GHRH receptor, then we get either an increase in cyclic AMP, increase in intracellular calcium, which causes the growth hormone release. That's that pulsatile action that we get with growth hormone that then goes through the body, hits the liver, IGF-1 goes up, okay? That's what we're looking for. So there are growth hormone releasing hormones available as peptides. There are growth hormone releasing peptides as peptides, okay? Sermorelin over here is the growth hormone releasing hormone that's approved by the FDA for patients with growth hormone deficiency. It sucks on its own, and part of the reason why, technically, except for tessamorelin, which I don't have a lot of experience with yet, but um, does appear to have some interesting details, which I'll briefly talk about. But all of these other ones, this is how this is what happens. So stimulation of the uh, growth hormone stimulating receptor can knock somatostatin off of the somatostatin receptor. So when that ghrelin hits, part of that is it's kicking off somatostatin. If something comes in and hits the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor, when somatostatin is active, you will get a, only a small release in growth hormone. When somatostatin is not there, if growth hormone releasing hormone hits that receptor, you get a bigger spike in growth hormone. The problem, so basically this is looking at, okay, you take, test, or you take sermorelin. You take sermorelin, which is gonna stimulate this. The problem is you have no idea when somatostatin is on that receptor and when it's not on that receptor. Yeah, it's, crap, it's a crapshoot. You'll still get a small effect, enough for the FDA to approve it. It has some clinical benefit, but when you're really trying to get the most out of this, you're not, okay? And that goes for all of these, except tessamorelin. Tessamorelin, which again is newer to me, and so I'm still doing more research into it, but it appears that even in the presence of somatostatin, it still gives a pretty large growth hormone spike. So, one of the ways we can circumvent this and overcome this is we use a growth hormone releasing hormone in conjunction with a gross, growth hormone releasing peptide, such as ipamorelin, hexamorelin, the old GHRPs or MK676 or 677 to stimulate this receptor, which then kicks off somatostatin. So that when you give both of these together, you ensure that somatostatin is not inhibiting growth hormone release. And here's a nice study confirming this, okay? So they have an intravenous bolus of either a GHRP plus a growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone releasing peptide on its own, growth hormone releasing hormone on its own. So this yellow would be like giving sermorelin on its own. This green would be like giving ipamorelin, right? Ipamorelin, a GHRP on its own. So this, because it kicks off somatostatin, has a bit of a better effect. And this is what happens with growth hormone release when you give both of them.
Okay, so there's a big, big synergistic effect in combining both of these. You like ipamorelin? I do. Ipamorelin is my preferred. Better than hexarelin? Yes, because hexarelin has, but it, so hexarelin and bam. My nice little graph I made, chart. <laughs> so, <laughs> mouse, mice, rat. <laughs> so, when we compare the different GHRPs, right, we have G, and these are, this is a first generation, second generation, and these two are more third generation. GHRP6 is pretty old. It causes a mild increase in growth hormone, but has big effects on cortisol and prolactin. The other thing with GHRP6 is it really stimulates appetite, which can be beneficial for some patients, right? If patients need to gain weight as part of their treatment that we're doing and they don't have cortisol issues or prolactin issues, I'm okay giving GHRP6. It's also a lot cheaper than the newer stuff because it's not as good for most people, but in the right person, it can actually be really, really good. GHRP2 is the second generation. We get a decently strong release of growth hormone. Still, some mild effects on cortisol and prolactin. Not as much as GHRP6. And you don't get as much hunger as you do the GHRP6, but you still get some hunger. Hexamorelin and Ipamorelin, Ipamorelin, you really don't get a lot of hunger with. Some patients will still get some, but compare, I mean, this is like, because I've, I've done all of these. This one here, like all of a sudden within like 20 minutes, it's as if you haven't eaten for like four days and your stomach is just like churning from that like hunger pain. It's intense, okay? So some patients can't handle that. But if we are using the growth hormone to help patients gain weight, then you just time that with food. You take this 15, 20 minutes before you eat and then you eat when that ghrelin is high and it actually helps them because they're not hungry, and then they're hungry, and then they eat. So it can be beneficial. Hexarelin gives the biggest growth hormone release. It also has the biggest effects on cortisol and prolactin, potentially increasing cortisol and increasing prolactin. And so in patients where I'm concerned about that, their prolactin's already on the high end, for example, then I don't like using hexarelin. Ipamorelin is not the strongest, but I would consider it the cleanest. Okay, it's the least sloppy of all the GHRPs, where it goes in, it does its effect with releasing growth hormone, and it doesn't do much else. So therefore, it's not as strong, but it doesn't have a lot of the other side effects. The compounding pharmacy I use, TaylorMade Compounding, also compounds Ipamorelin with the GHRH together, so that patients only have to do one injection instead of two. So that's another added benefit on why I use more ipamorelin than hexarelin. That answer your question? Can you combine hexarelin with the, the growth hormone to get some hormone yep. together to get the best effect to get much bigger spike? 100% of the time. Um, no, and I think it just in part because it's not the primary one that I use. And so it's rare. It's of all the times that I'm recommending a GHRP, it's maybe 10% of the time that we're choosing hexarelin. Yeah. Ipamorelin just, it works well enough that this, these two arrows is enough of a growth hormone release for most patients that I don't need to move to a big gun like hexarelin. Yeah. Could you just increase the dose to keep the ratio better? Um, you can, except for there's a saturation dose. Yeah. Which is typically what we are dosing at when we do this is saturation dose to the pituitary gland where if we go above that, we don't really see any positive benefits in additional growth hormone release. And so it, we can't really account for, we can't double this to get what hexarelin gives. Yeah. 
It has to do with binding affinity to the actual receptor. So our the, so going back here, there's a whole bunch of GHRHs. Okay, there's CJC twelve ninety five with DAC, without DAC, which I forgot to include the with DAC here, but there's one that is just straight, so if you're reading, it'll just say CJC1295. Mm -hmm. Then there's CJC1295 with a por part that's been removed, which is the DAC portion. This is also called mod GRF129, or just mod GRF, it's another name for it. There's tesamorelin, sermorelin, and then GRF18. Uh, I've never used GRF18. I still haven't used tesamorelin because I'm still doing more research on it. I've had patients come to me on sermorelin, but I've never used sermorelin in a patient. Uh, so kind of give you guys some insight. I actually started down this deep dive hole of growth hormone secretagogues probably about two years before I came out here to med school. And so it was just self-experimentation and reading and that kind of stuff. And so. Thankfully, when I got into clinical medicine, I never recommended Sermorelin because I knew how shitty it was compared to the mod GRF with Ipamorelin. So the big difference between these two and why this matters is the CJC1295, the Sermorelin, has a longer half-life than the mod GRF which again, initially they thought, oh, that's great. The, in, the patient has to take less injections. They can do one's daily injection versus two or three times a day injection because that's a longer half-life. But remember back to physiology. How does growth hormone release work? In pulsatile spikes. So, in women, this tends to do a tiny bit better than it does in men, but it's still not great because you're just raising your baseline levels of this GHRH. What works better is when you actually have a shorter half-life and you dose it more frequently and you get better pulsatile secretions. Because part of all this that happens is within the pituitary cells, when they dump out growth hormone, they dump out almost all the growth hormone that's in each cell. Then what happens is they have to replenish it. And they replenish it when somatostatin is there. So if you, one, do it too frequently, you can actually deplete the amount of growth hormone in the pituitary cells, and that can decrease efficacy of the injection. So if you were to do this every hour, for example, for the injections, as opposed to every three hours, the other thing is if you have a slow hit on this that is causing a slow trickle of growth hormone out, you're losing some of the efficacy of the big growth hormone spike. So that's why I use the CJC1295 without DAC, also known as mod GRF, over Sermorellin.